Hi. So, uh, so my name is Juliana Freire, and I've recently moved to NYU Poly. Um, and uh, for the past six years or so, I've been working on this idea of provenance and actually providing infrastructure so that tools can automatically record provenance. And why is this important? Right? <coughs> this is important because science today is very much data intensive, right? We got to a point where you know, it's very easy to get data. You can get data from many different sources, simulations, sensors, uh, user studies, web, ev everything, right? And then what happens is people use a plethora of different tools in order to make sense of this data, right? They use visualization tools like, uh, you know, ParaView, Visit, uh, scientific workflows, MATLAB, R, databases, etc. And as people use these, these tools to analyze the data, they create even more data, right? What people usually call uh, data products, um, you know, plots. I cannot get my mouse. Yeah, plots, tag clouds, molecules, and this is actually the Pacific Northwest uh, for you guys that live around here. Um, so, uh, and then once you have these results, you have to collaborate with people. And what do people often do? Lots of the scientists that I work with, what they will do is they will actually compose these uh, data products, they'll put in a PowerPoint presentation, send through email, get discussions, and so on. And then finally, when good results show up, uh, they publish their paper. And if my, right, uh, beautiful paper. But what is the problem? The problem is that once you have your paper, that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? There's lots of stuff that go in producing the paper that appears nowhere, is nowhere to be seen inside the paper, right? So as a result, what you have is that your scientific record is incomplete, and really you cannot reproduce the results. And there are lots of um, uh, quotes that I like about this, even from people that are sitting here in this room right now, right? It's impossible to verify these results. Uh, they're mostly pretty pictures, and uh, um, you know, there's no hope of repeating them. And they're often, you know, and because you cannot repeat them, they, you can consider them as just merely advertising. And as we've seen in the first talk, there's lots of implications for that, right? You know, there's, uh, the, there's uh, people can die, and there's, uh, and we've seen recently lots of cases of scientific misconduct. And the New York Times, I think every other month, there's an article about papers being retracted or incorrect results. So this is very serious, right? So what I'm going to try to convince you is that. Uh, one of the requirements to fix this problem is if we have provenance-rich science, right? So the idea here is simple. As you go through your process of getting data, analyzing, and publishing, provenance has to be central in this process. As you do all these things, all the steps must be tracked, right? And it's not just, you know, one tool. It's got to be over the whole process, right? And if you have that, then you can see what's in your iceberg. Right? Because the provenance will actually be your scientific record, detailed and hopefully reproducible. Right? And then what are the advantages of having these, uh, uh, or, or, or the important outcomes of having these provenance-rich publications? Right? Uh, we have had science has, you know, had, had a huge leap. We have computational science and you know, people are making great discoveries, but they're publishing the same way they were publishing 30 years ago. Right? So by having these reproducible publications, you can actually bridge the gap between the scientific process today and what publications should actually be. Uh, and if you have these papers that are reproduced, but they have deep captions, right? And you can actually repeat and you can uh, trust the results in the paper. And this is not new, as people have said. You know, people have used uh, note notebooks. And uh, if you do theory, mathematics or whatever, people publish their proofs and people can go over the steps and figure out whether that's right or wrong. Right? And what is nice is there's been a lot of uh, uh, buzz and lots of people are becoming more and more aware of the problem. And you see conferences like SIGMOD, uh, journals like the Biostatistics Journal, funding agents that are actually kind of like encouraging for now people uh, to actually publish to reproduce results. And one exception is uh, in terms of the character of the stick is that ETH uh, in Zurich, they actually have a requirement that all research produced by ETH researchers has to be reproducible. So if I get to an ETH researcher that published a paper and I ask them for their experiments, if they don't give me, they're in deep trouble. Right? Uh, 
and it's working. I can actually give you some uh, anecdotal examples of that. Right? And you know, there's been lots of workshops, people are discussing about this, trying to make this happen right? and in many different communities. Um, and these are just examples of some that I've been uh, involved in. Uh, and actually one of the interesting fact uh, that I, when I went to this Beyond PDF uh, workshop, it was mostly uh, bio folks, is that you know, I was there and I got these biologists coming to me and trying to convince me of the importance of reproducible research. So I felt so good because I've been trying to convince people for, about this for five years and finally, you know, it's kind of like it's happening. Um, so what are the benefits, right? So the you know, main benefit is that you're actually producing more knowledge. It's not just the text that is in your PDF of your, of your article. Uh, and this enables what we should have in science is that people should be able to stand on the shoulders of, science, of others, right, of the giants. Uh, and if we do this, science can move faster. Right? Why? Because I have some ideas, and it's happened to me several times that I, you know, I have an, uh, different, a new algorithm, and then I send email to somebody, and I ask, oh, can I actually get your code so that I compare my new stuff to your code? And then I get answers like, oh, my student left. And then I believe, right? Because students leave, you don't know where the code is or the date and so on. And I also got people to tell me, oh, my laptop was stolen at Singapore airport. Uh, so, and then my students have to spend six months to a year just re-implementing something so that you can compare it against the baseline, right? So it takes a long time. If people publish and reproduce results, science can move a lot faster, right? And uh, one thing that people often forget is that, you know, reproducibility is not just for others, it's for yourself, right? You get a new student, you get a new postdoc, and the stuff that the old students did, it's impossible to use, right? Um, and the other important consequence is that if you do that, you're going to... Uh, invariably have higher quality publications. Why? Because if I know all of you are going to be looking at my stuff, I'm going to be more careful. Right? And because all of you can look at my stuff and reproduce, you're more likely to find mistakes. Right? And we see lots of the mistakes being found, and I'm sure that that's just like a small fraction of the errors that actually are in papers because it's so hard to reproduce that people don't go through the trouble. If we went to the trouble, uh, go, uh, of checking all the papers out there, I think few would survive. Right? Um, another very important um, advantage of having these reproducible publications is the fact that we would be able to dis uh, describe more of the discovery process. Right? All the steps that you went through, right? and currently in papers, people only do, uh, uh, describe the positive results, the good things, the stuff that worked. And if we actually have you know, more, you know, even the things that didn't work, I think it would be very useful for people to learn also from your mistakes. Uh, and last but not least, if you have you know, all these experiments, if you have like a, a, um, a repository with these reproducer experiments, uh, that would be a wonderful resource. Why? Because there you provide people with lots of examples of how to use tools that you, know, you might not otherwise have access to, uh, different techniques, algorithms, right? And this could you know, greatly, uh, 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 I think, um, improve um, science and the reuse of knowledge. But then, that's all fine and dandy, but then there are issues, right? So uh, if you ask people about reproducible publication, the first thing they're going to say, it's just too hard. It's very time consuming. You write your paper, you're trying to beat the deadline, right? And then if you have to package everything, all the code, all the data, and so on, it just takes too much time, right? Um, and then it comes to the reviewers. Uh, that as uh, uh, the, the previous talk was mentioning, you know, it's very hard to reproduce these results. If you're a reviewer, you have to get the results, you have to get the code, try to compile, run it, and it's a mess. Why? Because people different, different, use different OSs, library versions, different hardware, and so on. So it takes a long time. It's very taxing on the reviewers. So, so what we need to do is really to simplify the process of going from your data analysis to uh, the publication so that people cannot claim, complain that it's too hard or uh, to do either the creation or the review of, the, of these articles. Right? So we've uh, started to work on this, project of this, on this problem, and my laptop has this thing that is jumping now. Uh, and uh, we started to build this infrastructure that supports you know, the scientific process, the complete scientific process from data acquisition to publication. Right? So uh, this infrastructure has tools that help authors uh, create these uh, reproducible papers. Uh, it has tools for testers to validate the work, not just replicate exactly like the authors uh, uh, published, but you know, try different input data sets, different parameters, and so on. Right? As well as uh, you know, infrastructure for uh, 
uh, storing sets of experiments and allowing people to uh, query and mine this uh, information. And this is very interesting because it would enable people to, um, uh, you know, kind of get, uh, sorry, obtain more knowledge. Like, for example, can we, using such a, a repository, discover better approaches to a, a given problem or find relationships between, you know, results that, that would not be otherwise possible, right? Uh, and one of the things that we discovered, and, and I, I think I'll, uh, the point will be clear by the end of the talk, is that there is no one size fits all solution for all of these steps, right? So the key thing is, you know, to be able to support different approaches for doing each of these steps, right? So let me first give you an example, and this is a, an example of a real reproducible paper that was uh, published uh, in JSTAT, right? And uh, we, I call it a providence switch paper, but you can read it as a reproducible paper. So let's look at this paper here. Okay, so let me maybe move just a little bit, right? So what is the idea here? Is that, you know, all the figures in this paper, all the results in this paper, they actually have a deep caption. So they have the computational, the specification of the computational process that was used to derive the result. Uh, you know exactly what libraries were used you know, with the versions and so on, and also all the data that is necessary to uh, reproduce the results, right? So let me open the paper on Adobe Acrobat, and here's that uh, figure that I have there as an example. So I can click on this figure, and when I click on this figure, it actually brings me up to the provenance uh, of that particular figure. So let me just I'll wait a little bit for this to start. Okay, so this is the workflow that was used to generate that figure, and I can execute. And I can actually inspect the result and see that it corresponds to what I had in the paper, right? Uh, and as a reviewer, or as a collaborator in this article, I could actually come to this workflow and actually change a parameter, like for example, for this A value here, I could try instead of one, I could try the 0 0.9, and I can execute, and I can compare the result, all right? So slightly different, maybe something interesting, I don't know much about the subject, it's uh, um, uh, simulations for quantum physics, all right? But one thing that I can do is that, you know, it's interesting, maybe I'm a call in this paper, I can actually add this new result in the paper, so I can save my results here. Let me do test 2.vt. I can come here and I can say, I can annotate my provenance. This is very much like uh, what, um, uh, uh, was shown for uh, the tool in the second talk, so I can actually say this is uh, A equals 0 0.9, right? I can save it, and I can actually say I want to embed this in a document, right? So I can just copy and paste uh, the ID, if you will, of that new result, and I can put that in my uh, ALPS paper. Right, so the, I had the old figure, now I have the new figure. And I just need to specify the width. Right, and I can come to a terminal, I can type make. And what it's going to be doing, see it's starting these trails, it's trying to generate that figure, you can choose it to uh, cache and so on. Oh, yeah, I didn't take it to cache, but anyways. And then I can open the paper. And here's the other figure, right? And it's also, you know, provenance switch. It will actually open it and so on, right? So just to give you an idea of, uh, um, you know, how this um, actually works in practice. Uh, and, oh, maybe I need very quickly. And there are other ways of actually publishing these results. So let me... Um, so we have this collaborator uh, from, um, uh, he's a physicist, he studies uh, computational flow models, uh, you know, stars exploding, supernovas and so on. And he likes to produce uh, these reproducible results. So he actually had create like, go through a lot of trouble to create, you know, whole pages saying, oh, this is my 
all my experiments, you can click here, download that, and so on. Right? And as you know, you know, people, it's too much work for people. But then another thing that we did with this uh, infrastructure is to actually allow people to produce results that people can interact with over a web browser so that you don't have to go through the trouble of installing things or downloading files. So here's a, um, a supplementary material that Joe actually created for a paper that he published at uh, the Sizey magazine. And uh, here, is one of his results uh, that was produced uh, with, with these trails. And actually, people can come here and actually change the values, uh, interact with the results, and say update. And this is actually executing that same workflow, right? And you can actually play with it uh, here on the web browser. Okay. So let me go back here. And uh, we actually have some videos uh, that show, you know, how you can do that in different kinds of environments, uh, both for LaTeX and uh, for wikis. Right? So let me go a little bit through some of the uh, components of this infrastructure. Right? So, so what we try to do is to kind of like uh, have tools for these three different steps, writing, reviewing, and then sharing or collaboration. Right? So the first part is, you know, how do we support authors to uh, create these reproducible papers, right? So in the first prototype of this infrastructure, we use the Vistrail system, which is a, a workflow-based system for data analysis and visualization. Uh, and uh, the system actually it combines features of visualization system and workflow system in the sense that, you know, you can do your data analysis and explore different visualizations and plots, whatever, whatever you want. But the nice thing is that because it's also based on workflows, you can actually mix and match different libraries to create uh, uh, your analysis. So in that workflow that you saw from the Alps paper, uh, uh, they, they have their own code, you know, the, uh, from the Alps library, but they also use matplotlib to uh, do the plot, right? Um, and another advantage of these trails here is that these trails actually gives you a very comprehensive uh, provenance infrastructure, right? So if a scientist use these trails to do their uh, uh, analysis, the provenance is going to be there. So publishing becomes easy in a way, right? Uh, or a li little bit easier, right? Um, and the system actually transparently caps off, uh, keeps off the provenance, not only, you know, the data provenance like this plot was generated by a given workflow, but also the exploratory process. That's something that uh, uh, was asked before, you know, can you branch in your history? So these trails actually capture everything that you try. You know, you try something, didn't work, you go back, then we actually, uh, I don't know if you actually saw the tree when I, I, I showed that Alps demo, right? Um, and another thing that these trails does, and I don't have time to talk about, but I'd be happy to talk, uh, to explain to people later, is that it actually uses, reuses this provenance information to help people create and refine the analysis, right? And it's open source. Uh, you can download it from vstrails.org, runs on platforms, and work with Python and Qt. Right? It has been used for by you know, a number of different groups in different domains. Yeah? But that's beside the point. So the, the, the important things that we get from using these trails, the first one is the fact that uh, you have a, um, uh, a more, I'll say, formal and precise way to actually define your computations, right? So, um, and uh, the advantage of that is that you can, in your paper, you can actually include something like this, a piece of Python code that actually generates an ISO surface of the visible human data set, right? Uh, but that can be complicated because if I'm a reviewer, how do I know what I can change or I should change in order to try things uh, or to validate the results, right? The nice thing about using these, you know, higher level specifications like a workflow and particular data flows is the fact that you can create abstractions, right? So, and you can actually create different levels of abstraction. So here's two examples. One is, uh, this is the actual workflow using uh, VTK, which is a visualization toolkit that reads a file, extracts the ISO surface, maps the data, and renders it. Right? And for a visualization person, that's great, you know? VTK, they know exactly the algorithm that was used. For me, I'm a database person. Be easier to read something like this, you know? Read file, extract as a surface display on the screen, right? And, you know, having this, these different levels of abstraction is very useful to help people not only kind of like better understand the, the, the uh, experiment, but also like when you have these repositories, it makes it easier to query and find things. Um, so the other thing that uh, one needs to realize is that uh, 
if you really want reproducibility, and this is a point that was made before today, um, is that the workflow provenance is not sufficient, right? Why? Because I can actually create an experiment, you know, that using that uh, workflow that I showed before, readify, extract, as a surface display on screen. I read this file, use the, this version of ETK, and then I send it to Ian. And then he, is, he inputs his, his workflow on his machine and he tries to run it. What happens, the first thing, is that, you know, users dot, uh, slash Julian of head dot ETK is not in his machine, right? Uh, so file not found. And I send him by email the file and then he tries to run and he cannot execute because he doesn't have ETK version 1.2. Right? So there's more stuff that you actually need to keep track of. You need more information about the computation environment, OS, library versions, etc. And in our infrastructure, we actually uh, try to make this, uh, to reuse what other people have done. So for example, this problem is very easily solved with virtual machines. Right? And there are simple solutions like, for example, CDE Pack that for Linux, it's able to gather all these dependencies and it could be easily used with these trails to you know, uh, 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 solve the, the, pro the tool dependency problem, right? The other thing that uh, one needs uh, to, to support these reproducible papers is a better file management, right? Uh, you know, where files are stored and how to keep track of these files. So one thing that is necessary, and I'm not gonna dwell on this because lots of good arguments have been made before today by Andrew, is that you need versioning, right? You need, you know, to use Git, SVN for, for uh, your data, right? You need to this, this, this issue of version. And the other thing is that uh, we also need to um, um, have a little bit of um, uh, reliability into the process because you know, people tend to change file names and do stuff, move things around. So one of the things that we did in order to um, address this problem is that we have this uh, framework for uh, supporting strong links between you know, results, data products, and the workflows that uh, produce them. So it's somehow like the cacher in a way where you can have like this hash function associated with the result, but the hash function actually um, has a link to the actual workflow and which corresponds to the set of libraries, computational tests and so on that were used uh, to generate um, the, the result, right? Uh, and finally, what you need is a way of connecting these results to their provenance. And in our infrastructure actually have, as you've seen, support for LaTeX, uh, wikis, HTML, and we also have support for adding such uh, uh, results to Word and PowerPoint. Right? So the second step uh, is review and validation, and uh, you know, the goal is, okay, how can we improve the quality of the reviews and you make the reviewer's life easier? Um, and again, for the execution environment, that we can use uh, virtual machines or CD, CD uh, pack in order to simplify the process of the reviewer getting the stuff and like, getting them to run, right? Um, but then that's not enough, why? Because you know, some people have data, data sets that are too large, they're using proprietary code or special hardware. So another important requirement for such an infrastructure is that it's able to support different execution modes, supporting local on the reviewer's machine, as well as mixed execution, right? Running codes may be at the author's machine or special hardware. Um, and finally, you need infrastructure for helping people test and validate the results. And uh, it's not just reproducibility, it's not just running exactly as I mentioned, but also workability, right? You want to explore different parameters, different configurations and so on. And this is something that these trails having been designed to uh, support exploratory tests in data analysis is very good for this, right? Because you can actually uh, reuse the actual these trails infrastructure to do this kind of um, exploration. Um, then the third step, which is publish uh, maintenance and reuse, um, one of the things that we've done is, uh, you know, this idea of simplifying interaction. And you saw the example that I gave for, the, for astronomy is that besides just having the documents, your Word or your PDF, you know, it's also useful to publish um, your results and interactive results, right, in other kinds of media, like, for example, portable device or uh, on the web. And we actually have the system called VizMashUp that once you have your workflows, it's very easy to automatically create this kind of um, 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 uh, interfaces, right? Um, the other problem that you have to deal with, and there's some questions from the back, you know, yeah, what happens in five years? What happens in two years and so on with your code, right? And yes, yeah, software evolves. And um, virtual machines address this to a certain extent because if you save everything with your virtual machine, hopefully if you have something that can run the virtual machine, you can actually get everything back, 
right? But there are lots of things that would not work, like for example, if you have HPC kind of experiments that run on big uh, clusters, you know, there's, there's no, I mean, good solution that I know of for that, right? But then there are some other things that you can actually do. So if software evolves and you have your workflow, we actually have uh, a mechanism that will automatically upgrade these workflows and try to use new uh, libraries. Um, and finally, this idea of uh, having these, uh, uh, you know, repositories of uh, shared experiments, right? And uh, I'm actually talking about this in this upcoming VLDB, uh, the kinds of uh, issues and challenges that you have in order to make, you know, this vision a reality, right? So there's lots of opportunities for um, uh, reuse, but then there's uh, lots of challenges too, because, uh, you know, I don't know if there are many computer scientists or database people here, but the problem is that here you have lots of different kinds of data, right? A search engine like Google would not be good enough for this because, you know, just searching for keywords over this, you know, huge repository is not going to be very helpful. So you need to have stuff that is more, uh, have queries that are more uh, structured. Like, for example, uh, some work that we have done in terms of, you know, trying to have a query by example interface to query workflows and look for workflows that have some particular patterns. Like, uh, oh, I want all the experiments that uh, use as a surface followed by a simplification or some specific patterns in the work, in, in the experiments, right? So, you know, we need to, to, to support that, but support that with, uh, in conjunction with keyword queries as well as other kinds of queries that maybe go even in the input data, right? Um, and uh, basically this uh, infrastructure, we've used it for uh, a number, and a number that has, has already been used in some different domains. So folks at ETH, uh, the guys at the, the Alps, uh, they've already published a number of uh, reproducible papers using this infrastructure. Uh, Joe Tolin is also using it, the, you know, in computational fluid dynamics. Folks in databases um, have started to use this also, and, you know, uh, they're actually examples. Um, if you go to this uh, web page on uh, uh, examples of papers that were written uh, and that they are reproducible. And another interesting experiment that we've done uh, was this uh, SIGMOD repeatability effort. It's similar to what uh, uh, people uh, was described from the biostatistics um, uh, journal. Uh, but then at SIGMOD, which is the top database conference, uh, this has been done since 2008. Right? So the idea is that people submit their papers and the accepted papers have the option of uh, asking for a repeatability seal. Um, and um, over the years, actually, there's, you know, a, a, a more adoption, if you will. So if you can compare results from 2010, you know, 20 submissions to the repeatability uh, 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 review, and in 2011, we had 31, right? And, uh, but that's still, you know, a very small percentage of the total uh, number of papers that are accepted uh, to SIGMOD, right? One thing that we did different in 2011, um, uh, actually the first year that I got involved in this, was that we tried to lay out a set of guidelines for the authors, right? Not only that, we created a set of tutorials, uh, and that's something that was talked about, you know, it's like basically how should people go about uh, to create these reproducible papers, and we tried to address, uh, you know, common scenarios, like, for example, people that have large data, people that have to execute code in special hardware, and, uh, and so on, right? So what were the, the results of this experiment? Um, so what we've noticed is that the reviewing is still challenging because we have the guidelines, but people don't always follow it, right? So there's lots of them. Uh, some of the submissions, uh, when they fail, they would fail just in the setup because people forgot to, about the dependencies, right? And had they used a virtual machine or maybe CDE pack, that would be a, no, a, a non problem, no issue, right? Uh, and uh, there's also, we also tried to do a little survey in terms of uh, people that did not submit, why didn't they submit? And uh, the most common um, uh, uh, answers were the fact that, you know, the issues with uh, intellectual property uh, on the software, uh, sensitive data, as well as uh, specific requirements for hardware, like people that are doing um, research on databases on flash uh, memory, right? Uh, and these are all valid um, uh, um, justifications, right? But this does not explain 
uh, the distribution of uh, submissions over uh, different geographical uh, regions. Right? It doesn't explain why most accepted papers from Asia actually submitted to the reproducibility uh, experiment, but most Americans did. Right? So there's more to that. And then we actually asked a bunch of the Americans, you know, why? Uh, and basically the, the response, and I think that, you know, this is what's happening today, is that it's too much work for the benefit that's going to derive. Right? Um, and this is an issue that we're going, as a community, going to have to address, right? And I think that at this point in time, that's one of the uh, major uh, barriers. Accepted papers or submissions? Just accepted papers. Accepted. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you, if you want to know the number, uh, we don't have everything, right? But anyway, so it's like a... Well, I was wondering, are people going to see it as a, as a way to improve their chance of getting the paper accepted? I'm sorry? I'm no. wondering if people measure seeing it as a way to improve their chance of getting the paper accepted and it worked. In right? the future? I mean, you know, if, if they're worried about how, how many they punch my paper through. Oh, I see. No, but this, this, this is done only for accepted papers. Right. Right, yeah. Yeah, so it's just accepted papers, yeah. Excuse me. Also, the regulations in Asia are different in America, right? I'm sorry? What is legal in Asia about collecting data may be not legal in, in America. So that's also an issue because people in the States don't want to get around to that violating rules or violating you know, like privacy? Yeah, so that, that may be one, right? But see, this, this database conference, I mean, uh, lots, of the lots of the papers are not dealing with, you know, biomedical that's kind true. of information. That's true, but they are maybe coming from, uh, you know, people on Facebook or Yahoo. Exactly, or right? Or but then we actually have ways of doing that, right? So we actually, uh, one of the tutorials that we prepared said, okay, you can actually provide a web service that people will not you know, kind of like copy your data, but have some way just to access to see whether the plot actually is a val val uh, valid plot, right? Uh, so I think that there is some issue, right? I think that there's some legal issues and that some people cannot really do it. But my impression is that many people don't do it just because it's too much work. It's too much hassle, right? I think that, that at least for this community, that's, that, that's, I think, the major issue, right? So that brings me to the point that we, we need more and better incentives to get people to uh, uh, adopt this idea of reproducible research, right? So this idea of having a seal of quality in your paper is clearly not sufficient, right? Uh, people don't see that as being like deriving uh, uh, enough benefit, right? Uh, yes, we have to convince people that uh, if we do this, we're going to have higher quality software, higher quality publications, results. It's going to be better for your own group because it's going to be easier for new students at postdocs to, you know, get into the work. But the real thing is, you know, how people get mileage out of these, right? Getting more citations. So I love the graph uh, that John showed with, uh, you, know, the, you know, that's something that I'm actually going to steal too so that I can use in this publication. I'll give you the whole presentation. Okay, good. It's polemic. Okay, yeah. And, and you know, there's also some uh, evidence, people from NanoHub, they do like nano whatever research, and they have some preliminary results which show that the people that publish their experiments in NanoHub, actually the number of citations is much higher than papers that don't have the, uh, the, the software available, right? Um, but we need to improve maybe, you know, like maybe in tenure process, in, in uh, funding agencies, or in our communities, how do we better recognize, how do we give people more credit for doing all this extra work uh, to uh, uh, create uh, reproducible publications? And that also brings up the question, you know, do we need a whip, right, the stick? Do we need that? Uh, some disciplines you won't be able to publish in the journals if you don't provide the data. Should al we also be requiring that people publish their code and their experiments? Um, but, you know, uh, besides that, we still need better tools, right? Because uh, it, it's true that we have some tools today, but it's still not ideal. You have a question? Yeah, um, quality problems um, more reliability. I mean, it should attract more citations, does it? Uh, I mean, so, so there is uh, anecdotal evidence that papers which publish their code, right, get more citations, right? But what I'm saying is just like from the SIGMOD uh, experiment that we did, it doesn't seem to entice many of the Americans to publish that just, just to get that seal. So that's why I'm making the point that we need better, you know, different ways of recognizing that extra work.
But even if you show some kind of correlation, you can see that quality. And right, so that's something that you know, we hope to get data over time, and we're going to be tracking that. Um, so, so basically, there are tools out there, right? And uh, one thing that we've seen is that people complain, oh, but my data is this size, my data is in a different uh, uh, server, my code only runs on this particular hardware, right? So there's no one-size-fits-all solution for this, right? But lots of us here are building tools. And, you know, seeing the talks before, there's lots of things that people talked about that we actually implemented in Vistrios, right? There's some things here that, that were talked about that we don't have in Vistrios. Right? But I'm sure there's like a common uh, core of things that we could all share, right? And try to uh, build, you know, collectively get together, join forces and build this, this reproducibility toolkit. That there's a bunch of components that can be mixed and matched, right? To create solutions that are required for, you know, different researchers, different domains and so on, right? Uh, and we need standards and guidelines, right? That's, that's very important. And I put the S here in bold because it's not going to be a single standard like we have BBTEC, EndNote, or have PDF and we have Word, right? It's got to be several standards, but at least, you know, we have a, a core, a well-defined core of things that people should uh, look for and aim to do. Uh, and that goes both for authors as well as for tool builders, right? Because for tool builders, for example, it's important to support provenance capture, uh, connecting the results to, you know, version uh, 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 data and so on, right? And last but not least, you need provenance support in applications, right? You cannot re uh, rely on people to remember, I did this, I did that, and so on. Uh, and that raises uh, some, you know, practical as well as uh, more fundamental problems in terms of how to integrate provenance as derived um, by uh, um, different tools. And I thought that, uh, yeah, me. Right. So basically, my vision. Let me just see. Yeah. My vision for this uh, is, and this ended up being a, too busy of a slide, right? But the reality is that you know people don't just use R. People don't just use you know uh, a particular you know data set or tool, right? This is a real example. I'm working with these folks at the Cornell Ornithology Lab, and here's one of the, one workflow that they use in order to analyze their data. They collect uh, bird sightings from all over through citizen science. They run the STEM model that generates predictions uh, of where birds, uh, different species of birds are. Right? Uh, they use R to do some analysis. They also use this tool that we built called BirdViz. Right? Uh, they sometimes use Matplotlib to do some plots. And in the end, they prepare presentations, PowerPoint. Right? So what is the idea? The idea is that you know, everything that you do here should be provenance rich, right? So whenever STEM is run with some Oracle data, right, uh, I know exactly the version of Oracle or the state of the table that was actually read at that point in time. And by the way, this is possible. Oracle now has something called Total Recall that allows queries, uh, these temporal queries. I can actually say, select star from this table as off, and you can give like the timestamp, right? Uh, you know, STEM, when it generates these predictions, the predictions should come annotated with all that information, right? So that when I I'm end up with this uh, presentation, it's provenance rich, and I know where everything came from, uh, the, which table was used, which version of STEM, uh, which scripts, and so on, right? So this is where we should get at. And just to close, um, I'd like to give you a little bit of history and... Uh, a challenge to this community, right? So a long time ago, I was a PhD student, and you know, I, my advisor was very anal about citations, right? And I spent a long time trying to build the reference list. I mean, people here are young, don't remember that, but you have to go find the proceedings or walk to the library or to your advisor's office, flip through the pages, type the title, type the authors, page blah, blah, right? And put it in your paper, right? What happens today? I can just Google or Bing, uh, the author name, part of the article title. I'm taken to these nice places, DBLP, uh, ACM Digital Library. They export in, in various formats. I just click, copy and paste in my paper and boom, I'm done, right? Can we do the same for scientific publications, scientific experiments? Can we make it that, that easy, right? And I think we can and we will, but I don't know how long it will take. Uh, so just to conclude, uh, so I hope that I convinced you that uh, provenance is crucial and for science and it's also an enabler for these executable papers. Um, it 
there's no question that it must be at the center of the scientific process. You know, everything that we do in science should have provenance. Um, I described, uh, gave a brief overview of this end-to-end -end solution that we built and we use these trails uh, for, for it. But we're actually currently working on um, getting this infrastructure uh, uh, integrated with other tools. So for example, we're working with folks from Cytoscape to add provenance to Cytoscape. And then once we have that, the same infrastructure can be reused. Um, and you know, as I, I, there's lots of challenges still, several open uh, research questions, and also lots of philosophical questions, and I think cultural changes that will need, are needed in order to uh, make this all um, a reality. So uh, just thanking people that have helped. You know, I've worked a lot with a big group of people that are interested in uh, uh, reproducible research. Uh, work has been funded by different places, and thank you. I finished on time, wow. So maybe we have time for a couple of questions before we Yes. So, you know, I, I'm wondering with the future disability, um, is it too easy to produce a paper? Is that a problem? Because is it, is it too easy to write a paper? Because the thing is, is that if I have new data, I can write a paper, right? And so essentially there's so many papers out there that the idea that I could really spend time on it, if I do that, I'm you know, not allowing myself to see the latest thing that's coming out. And even if I think about computer science, and then you must have done a paper with LNCS, which, you know, the margins are larger than the actual text size. Um, so, you know, which doesn't really give you any... Which computer science is this? No, no, LN, the lecture notes in computer oh, science, right? Yeah, yeah. The margins are huge, and then, you know, there's not much room for text. So the question is, is that even the way we format our papers, you know, you know, LNCS can maybe get 10 pages, so I'm wondering if we've evolved to the fact where we've been producing these papers, these formats, that actually they're not designed to do reproducibility at all, um, that they're too constrained. And so I'm just curious what's your sort of you know, opinion about that? Because I'm almost wondering if we need to slow down so that we can do reproducibility instead of trying to you know, create new data, show this thing, so the, we don't really do that. So this is a very good point, right? And there's a, a, yes, we're publishing too much. It's, uh, there's, you know, uh, publish or perish, mm -hmm. right? If we don't have enough papers, we don't get tenure, don't get promoted, then we are dead. So I think that uh, basically that led to this, you know, I think over publication. I think that, you know, yes, we should slow down and we should give more weight to higher quality publications. There are lots of papers out there that are like, write once, read never. Right? That people never read or never reuse or, you know. So it, for these papers, it's not worth it to spend the time doing their producibility. Science is particularly bad. If you look at the journal impact factor, they're barely above one, if you're even lucky. Right? So most of the things in computer science, to me anyway, aren't really read. We do produce a lot of those. And it's kind of like, in the end, you know, what are we getting out of that as a discipline? So I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> So there was a there was another question. Yeah. Was there one more question? No, I'm just okay. I have more of a comment, but I okay. your question. Um, so my comment is actually um, regarding the uh, review process. So I was just recently involved in a, I'm a grad student. So I was recently involved in a review process for FSE, which is like Sigma. It's uh, FSC, it's foundational software engineering. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a kind of a top tier vendor for <laughs> software engineering research. And the the the, the professor who was, who was the head of the committee for reviews. I thought one really good thing he did was he put senior grad students as the program committee for the reproducibility um, review. And I thought that was a great thing because one, grad students are closer to the kind of the grind, right? So like grad students are the ones who are coding more. So they're more motivated to be able to try to reproduce stuff. And two, like that gets exactly. Right. Um, we we did that for Sigma. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. So I think for my suggestion for people who want to like who are journal, you know, people who are editors of journals. For getting people to review these uh, reproducible documents and such, I think getting grad students to do, I think is, yeah, I think it's yeah. Great. So, so we've we have done that. Perfect. Yeah, and, uh, and that's good to know that you know more people are doing mm -hmm. that. So recently, yeah. we were actually contacted by folks from HPDC, High Performance Distributed Computing, and they want to adopt the same you know thing that we're doing at Sigmod. So I think that slowly this is happening. Uh, but yes, just a really quick question. Um, so the idea is that the Research that can be reproducible, especially um, those papers that publish the code and everything, they tend to have more citations. 
Had those studies been filtered for self-citation? So, 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 so far, I don't think that there is any serious study. What I, what I said is that, this, that there is anecdotal evidence. It's not a study. So basically, they said, that I heard this talk from Nano Hub that says, you know, papers that are there have higher citation than papers that are not, right? And, you know, there's a similar thing with the, with the, the, the genes and so on. Right? So but I, I think it's uh, intuitive, but I do think that there needs to be, you know, more, uh, um, you know, uh, I'd say principled studies. But right now we don't have much data, right? Because people, you know, at least in my, in computer science, not many people uh, uh, do this the reproducibility. Okay? Very few people do. So it's hard right now to actually get significant data to make it, to do a study. Is anybody aware of any studies that have looked at there's one. Okay, so I, I want to do this, and I've been looking at it, and I found one that came out of social sciences where they looked at the journal of peace studies, and then they found this nice positive correlation. But it's on one journal that's on social science. It was done a few years ago. But that is on my research. And I'd like to have to yeah, I think that, that, that that would be something interesting. And I think the results are going to be positive. Well, I, I because it's, it's intuitive, yeah. right? I mean, I, I, I'm doing work on breath and that. Right? And I need to compare my work with other people. There's only one uh, so open, uh, sorry, available software by the, done by Denis Shasha. I'm sure I'm going to do that, right? But then lots, lots of others are not available, and I'm not even going to cite them, of course. Well, anecdotally, I would, I mean, it's, of course, it's not at all uh, quantified, but I would say that certain things like the field compressive sensing that sort of sprung out from California, that because uh, Donahoe and Candace and various other people sort of um, wrote some of, some of the uh, early influential papers also made their codes all available. I think that really led to a real explosion in, in other work being done. Yeah. Well, piggybacked on each other. Right. Donovan has a story. It's, um, it's actually on Keep Online. Like after he was, uh, became one of the most highly cited authors, they, he sort of wrote this half ton in cheek article about how that maybe came about. And one of the things we referenced was his release of Wave Lab software before right. MATLAB had a package. Um, to, to, to do these, to implement these tools and how they sort of maybe complicated. But it's anecdotal. I mean, what we have right now is anecdotal. Great, so I think we'll wrap it up here. Uh, lunch should be in the same location.